service of worship, the first Sunday in Advent, which is the preparation for Christmas. As we go through some announcements, please sign the friendship pad. It should be in front of you. It just lets us know you're here, and we promise not to send you any junk mail. I promise. <laughs> normally, normally, I think it's a good rule that cell phones should be turned off in church, always. But I've got a very pregnant wife at home this morning <laughs> who was having some contractions last night. So I, I don't know if I can do this, but today there's a dispensation, a special dispensation for having cell phones on in church. Um, Phil Durfee brought some food, extra food, non-perishable food items to share there in the back. So if you can use those, if those would be of any help to you, they're, you're free to take uh, whatever it is you need from that back table in the corner there. Um, Bell ring for the Salvation Army is going to be on Saturday, December 3rd from 9 to 7 at Fred Meyer inside the grocery door. There's a sign-up sheet in the back if you would like to serve in that way this season. Uh, the Presbyterian women give you another opportunity to serve. Um, they invite you to bring gifts of food, toiletries, household cleaners, gloves, mittens, socks for women and children of all ages who are living at the Nampa Women's Shelter. So it's a great way to give back this season. And there's an opportunity to do that right here at church. <coughs> Lastly, uh, on Thursday, December 8th, so that's a change from our normal time, Bible study on Thursday evenings starting December 8th for three consecutive Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. We're going to study the purpose of Christmas, which is by a man named, a pastor named Rick Warren, best-selling author, wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. Many of you, many of you probably read it, um, but that'll be our Advent study this season. And here's a quick video that gives you an introduction for, to the content of the study. You know, it's amazing to me that people celebrate Christmas year after year after year, often not even knowing the meaning of it. Uh, it would be like if I were to give you a Christmas gift, and I came over to your house a year later, and I say, how'd you like the gift? And you didn't even have it unwrapped. They say, well, I, I meant to, but I, I never got around to it. I'm sure it's good. Well, God has a Christmas gift for each of us, and if we don't unwrap it, we miss the whole meaning of Christmas. Christmas is about getting to know God on a personal basis. It's not about Santa, it's not about the gifts, those are all fine things, but what it's really about is what split history into A.D. and B.C. It's the most significant event in history, and that's what the purpose of Christmas is all about, why it's important. You know, at this time of season, uh, a lot of people lose their joy. Christmas is also a time when suicides go up, depression goes up, loneliness goes up, because they say, everybody else is happy, why am I not happy? Let me give you a little secret give your life away. Instead of working on people making you happy, look for others to make happy during this season. It is in giving ourselves away that we find true meaning, we find true purpose, we find the joy of giving. Here's what Christmas means. You matter to God. You matter to God so much that He came to earth in human form so that you could know what He's like. You know, it's kind of hard to, to describe what God's like, this, you know, spirit in the sky. I can't relate to a spirit when I look at God in a human form, uh, then I can see, that, oh, that's what God is like. And my suggestion to you is in your sorrow, in your sadness, in your grief, turn to Christ and let him explain to you the true meaning of Christmas this year. So that's uh, the purpose of Christmas. December 8th is the first class, Thursday at 6.30 p.m. I hope to see you there. Rick Warren is going to lead us through that topic, and it's exciting. So with that, why don't we stand and greet each other with a friendly welcome.
Good morning and happy Sunday to everyone here. Good morning. Please stand and Today we will light the first candle of Advent. The candle represents hope. Just as Israel hoped for the coming of the Messiah, we hope for the blessing of God upon our neighbors, friends, and family. Scripture says that hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. May we hold fast to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Let us remain standing and open up the hymn 559 and then page 473, all found on the screen or in your hymnal. Mm -hmm.
Let's please have the children come forward. Good morning, everyone. Hi. How are you? How was your Thanksgiving? Did you eat a lot? Did, I, I did, ate. Did you, you ate a lot? Good for you, Joe. Did oh, you have pumpkin did, pie? I, um, I tried to taste the pumpkin pie, and then me and Cara ate ice, vanilla ice cream. Vanilla ice cream instead. Yeah. Pumpkin pie is not for everyone, but vanilla ice cream, pretty much everyone likes that, huh? Well... Today, the scripture, the reading from the Bible, is about giving thanks. What are, um, what are some things that you're thankful for? I'm this year? thankful for my new brand gun with, with the rubber band skin. Ooh, that sounds cool. You're thankful for your new rubber band gun. What else? Is anyone else thankful for anything? What are you thankful for? Food. Food? Yeah. <laughs> Food is awesome. What are you thankful for? Family, that very, that's a very good thing. Anyone else have any ideas of what you could be thankful for? Yeah? Uh, your cousins. Cousins, yeah. A lot. I'm Family and what? For cousins. Cousins, yeah. What do you think? My house. Your house, yes. To have a nice house with shelter. New, next, one last question, a different one. Oh. When, when are some times that we are supposed to say thank you? Like, let's say we're at a restaurant and the server drops off our food. Should we say thank you then? Yes. Yeah. What if somebody at school, like a teacher, helps us with our assignment? We should say thank you then. Yeah, there are times in life we should say thank you. And the scripture this morning tells us something we might not have thought of on our own, which is that saying thank you can make us happier. Being thankful and saying thank you can fill us with joy and make us happy about the things that we have. And that's really good news. Why don't we pray and thank God? God, we thank you that your Bible, your word calls us to say thank you, both to the people in our lives that help us, like our parents and our teachers, uh, but also, God, that we should say thank you to you for the good things that we have. And thank you also that when we do that, you fill us with joy and happiness. Lord, help us to have thankful hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Joy. Hear the call to confession. You know the secrets of the universe and the secrets of the human heart. You know and understand us, for you examine our inner lives. Nothing is concealed from you, nothing hidden from your sight. We pray that this be your will. Forgive all our wrongs, pardon us for every act of injustice. Help us atone for all our moral failures. We are estranged and hiding, separated from you, God, and from each other. Sin has come between us. We feel jealousy, envy, condemnation, shame, guilt, and fear towards one another. Like Adam and Eve, our first impulse is to run and hide. This increases our loneliness. It is not good for us to be alone, but we are. Forgive us for our sin, our seclusion, our broken relationships, and hear our prayers. God, you made us for each other, for loving fellowship as a family with you as father, each other as brothers and sisters. By the shedding of your blood on the cross, you made us a united family. Forgive us 
and continue to unite us in the kinship of your body and blood. Amen. Amen. shall be. Amen. World without end, without end. Amen. World without end, without end. Amen. World without end, without end. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Please be seated. Now let's come together in a time of prayer and we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Let's bow our heads. Gracious and loving God, we gather this morning to give you thanks. To give you thanks for the blessings, many of which we confess that we've taken for granted. Thank you for our families. Thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of health. Thank you for the wealth, the blessings that you make available to us here in this country and for the freedom to worship you. Lord, we pray for those who have not been given quite as much as we have. Lord, they are on our hearts this morning. We ask that you would bless those who are in need those who are less fortunate than we, and that you would also make us instruments, make us your co-workers in making this world a better place in reaching out to those who are in need. Lord, as we prepare for your coming, as we look forward to Christmas, make our hearts ready, just as we would prepare our families and our homes for the coming of a new child. Help us to prepare our lives for your presence with us that you would be with us in every moment, not just in this room and not just on Sunday mornings, but every hour of every day of our lives. Walk with us and help us to live our lives in light of that. Lord, we ask you for help and we give you praise for the things that go on in our collective lives. We lift up to you this morning requests for travel blessings as folks are on their road to travel during this busy season. We pray for Lori Buser, who's sick and can't find the cause. We pray for healing and for wisdom for her doctors. We ask your presence and blessing on Les, who is recently diagnosed with liver cancer. Lord, be with that family and those doctors as well. Lord, we pray for Carter and Asher, who are sick this morning and upset that they couldn't come to church. We thank you for them and ask that your healing touch be on them. Lord, we pray for a granddaughter who is very sick and in the hospital this morning. We lift up to you the health of the mainline Protestant churches. We ask that you would keep us strong and vital, that our voice would still be alive in this culture. All these prayers and praises we lift up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray as he taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In worship. There are moments when we take time to uh, be thankful. There are times that we, uh, in, the art of praise in itself is tied so much into thankfulness. Uh, sometimes we can prepare our hearts for a sermon for, with a video. Sometimes we can prepare our hearts with singing. 
Um, today, I, I ask that we prepare our hearts in just a time of reflection and a time of reflecting on that which we are thankful for. Amen. This morning I ask you to join with me in asking the question, what does it mean to be thankful? What does it look like? And what difference can it make in our lives when we have a thankful heart? The scripture comes this morning from the book of Psalms, chapter 42. And it is an example of what a thankful heart can do, the way thanksgiving, the way gratitude can transform our emotional state from that of sadness and depression to one of hope. Listen to the word of the Lord. Just like a deer that craves streams of water, my whole being craves you, God. My whole being thirsts for God, for the living God. When will I come and see God's face? My tears have been my food both day and night as people constantly question me. Where is your God now? But I remember these things as I bear my soul, how I made my way to the Almighty One's abode, to God's own house, with joyous shouts and thanksgiving songs, a huge crowd celebrating the festival. Why, I ask myself, are you so depressed? Why are you so upset inside? Hope in God, because I will again give him thanks, my saving presence in my God. My whole being is depressed. 
That's why I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep called to deep at the noise of your waterfalls, all your massive waves surged over me. By day, the Lord commands his faithful love. By night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my solid rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I have to walk around sad, oppressed by enemies? With my bones crushed, my foes make fun of me, constantly questioning me. Where's your God now? Why, I ask myself, are you so depressed? Why are you so upset inside? Hope in God, because I will again give him thanks, my saving presence and my God. This is the word of the Lord. So, this morning we talk about gratitude and thanksgiving, but first we ask, what is thanksgiving? What is gratitude? Is it an emotion? Is it a feeling? Is it an attitude or a state of mind? Sometimes it's helpful to define words by their opposites, and the opposite of gratitude is not, well, you could say it's ingratitude, but that's not very helpful. I think the opposite of gratitude is entitlement. And there's a lot of entitlement in our culture, in our world today, isn't there? Who do you think of when I say the word entitlement? Who comes to mind? Might be a coworker who thinks they deserve everything and shouldn't have to work as hard as the rest of you. Maybe, maybe it's a child or a grandchild that you feel like is behaving in an entitled way. When I hear the word entitlement, a memory comes to mind. My seminary years, I was, I was just about as nerdy as you can imagine. And so after I took my Old Testament classes, I became you know, a teacher's assistant, which is like a glorified teacher's pet. But part of my job as a teacher's assistant in seminary was to grade papers to grade papers written about the Torah, the prophets, and the writings of the Old Testament. And to my surprise, I found that seminary students, like myself, were often entitled. They were often entitled. Some of them believed that because they had answered God's call to go to seminary and to be pastors, because they had foregone a lucrative career on Wall Street or as a doctor or lawyer or whatever to become a humble pastor, they thought they deserved good grades because they were such faithful servants. And some of them were shocked and angry to find out that the professor I worked for didn't quite see things that way. And they were mad when they weren't given a good grade just because they were such faithful servants of God. So when I hear the word entitlement, that's what I think of. I think of those entitled seminary students that thought they deserved a passing grade, whether their work measured up or not. But saying that gratitude is the opposite of, of entitlement might not help us. It's a self-examination problem, isn't it? We're not naturally very good at self-examination. Other people are entitled, but we're not. Entitlement's the word we use to describe them. They are entitled. We, on the other hand, we earned and we deserve. That's the way we see the world. They, those people are entitled. Earning is for us. In the movie Shenandoah, Jimmy Stewart plays a farmer named Charlie Anderson owns a pretty large farm during the Civil War, but he works it alone with his, with his family. And he's a widower. His wife has passed away. She was a very faithful Christian. And in honor of her only, Jimmy Stewart's character, Charlie, continues to give prayers at the dinner table. And there's a great scene where Charlie and his family sit down at the table with lots of food, and Charlie gives his obligatory Thanksgiving prayer and he said he bows his head and he says Lord 
We cleared this land. We plowed it. We sowed it. We harvested it. We cooked the harvest. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel. It wouldn't be here, and we wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. But we thank you just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. <laughs> the great prayer. It's funny. It's funny because it's ironic. Because the content of the prayer, the theme of the prayer, Thanksgiving, contradicts the attitude of the prayer, which is not actually grateful, but self-reliant. Now, Charlie wouldn't describe himself as entitled. He'd describe himself as having earned it all. He'd describe himself that way. But what's he missing? What's Charlie missing? The answer is God. It's God that gave him the ability to work. The health that allowed his body to go out in that field and the health of his children to work the fields. It's God who created the fields on which he stands as he does his work. See, it's at that point where our fortune and our blessing is most because of us. At that very point where we have earned it the most, that's where we have to be the most grateful. Where our fortune has depended on us, we owe the most thanks. Because God created us. To paraphrase the poet John Milton, did you request God to mold you as you are? Did you solicit God out of the darkness of non-existence and ask him to promote you to the being that you are? Now, at that point where our success is most because of us, we owe God the most thanks. And that brings me to my second point about gratitude. That is that gratitude demands an object. You can't just be thankful. But that's an incomplete sentence. I'm very thankful. To who? To what? It's hard to imagine an atheist saying, I'm so very thankful. To what and to who? <clears throat> gratitude demands an object, an address. And so it's in this way that gratitude and thanksgiving is dependent on faith. Right? To be thankful, you have to believe that there's someone or something in the universe that's more powerful and more responsible for your good fortune than you. So faith is the precondition for gratitude. And gratitude is the precondition for happiness. Go back to the last line of the scripture, if you could. There, why I ask myself, are you so depressed? Why are you so upset? Hope in God because I will again give him thanks. My saving presence and my God. Notice the movement of the passage. The words of scripture here move from sadness and depression towards gratitude and thankfulness. It's a thankful heart that pulls whoever wrote this beautiful psalm out of the depths of sadness and depression and into hope. So faith gives rise to gratitude and gratitude gives rise to happiness. Not superficial happiness, but that happiness that comes from a deeper place, from hope in a God who's bigger and greater than we are. Now, the way this can play out in our lives is illustrated by a story that my wife sent me a couple weeks ago. It's a story written about a young mother, a little bit like Sarah. And, and in this story, the, this young mother, she, she had a long, hard week. She's tired, she's exhausted, she hasn't slept, she's been moving nonstop, and she has to bring her two toddlers to the grocery store, which if you've managed a toddler before, you know is no easy task. Now her two toddlers were full of energy and giddy, and they were, they were touching everything, and they were constantly talking and yelling, and the chorus began as she walked through the supermarket with her shopping cart. Can we have popsicles? Can I eat that? And she replying, don't touch that, leave that alone, 
please be quiet. And at the end of her rope, her nerves frayed to the very last one. She bowed her head and sighed. And as her head sank to the floor, she felt two fingers reach out, touch her cheek, and lift up her face. And in front of her stood an older lady. And she writes, she writes this. At that moment, two soft fingers reached out, lifted my face. Chin up, dear. An old woman, easily 80, dressed as nice as nice could be, with beautiful pearl earrings and set hair, smiled warmly. I smiled back. I'm so tired, I said. The woman looked at the young mother and her children and said, we're all tired. It's just a matter of what we're tired of. I'm tired of silence. My husband is gone. My children are grown. And most days I don't hear so well. So for me, this noise is nice. Enjoy it while you can. This was just what the young mother needed to hear. To be grateful in the midst of her trials and her struggles. To give thanks for the blessings that she had. To be reminded by this older woman of the blessings that she had in her life that others don't enjoy. Faith gives rise to gratitude. Gratitude gives rise to joy. As we say goodbye to Thanksgiving and we head towards Christmas, let's remember these three lessons. Let's remember that when our blessings are most earned, when we feel like we've earned it the most, that's the time to be the most thankful. And let's remember that gratitude demands an object. That God, who created us out of nothing, deserves our gratitude this season. Let's not forget about God. And lastly, let's move towards happiness and joy. Not by trying harder, not by reading a self-help book, but by starting with faith, moving to gratitude, and being joyful about the gifts that we have. Let's pray and ask God for help with that. Lord, we thank you that you did create us out of the darkness of nothing. That whatever we are, whatever virtues we have, our work ethic, Lord, they are from you. Because you made us out of nothing, and we didn't ask to be created. Lord, we, we ask that you would give us the gift of faith, that we would hold you close, that we would not forget about your presence, as we are so likely to do. And Lord, may that faith move us to gratitude, and may gratitude move us into a place of joy this holiday season. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now bring forth our tithes and offerings. Grateful for each hand we hold Gathered round the table From far and near we travel home Blessed that we are able Grateful for this sheltered place With light in every window Say welcome, welcome, share this feast Come in and away from sorrow Father, mother, daughter, son 
neighbor, friend, and friendless. All together, everyone, in the gift of loving kindness. Grateful what for what's understood and all that is forgiven. We try so hard to be good, to lead a life worth living. Father, mother, daughter, son, neighbor, friend, and friendless, all together, everyone. Let grateful days be endless, grateful for each hand we hold, gathered round this table. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Let us remain standing and uh, sing hymn 552, Give Thanks, O Christian People.
I'm susceptible to entitlement just as much as anyone I know. So may God give us faith and may faith give us gratitude and gratitude joy. Hear the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Good morning.